Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the bullpen. Of course, we're devastated. I mean, this we've been here 65 years and have somebody shooting in your church. But, you know, we don't understand why these things happen, but we know God's in control. And we're going to pray for that little five-year-old boy and pray for the lady that was deceased, her family and all, and, and the other gentlemen. But I don't know. It's just um, kind of in a fog. But, you know, just believe that, you know, we're, we're going to stay strong. We're going to continue to, to move forward. And there are forces of evil, but... The, the forces that are for us, the forces of God are stronger than that. So we're going to keep going strong and just, uh, you know, doing what God's called us to do. Lift people up and give hope to the world. Yep, his statement was kind of like his sermons, all right? Mm -hmm. It kind of avoids controversy. It doesn't really go back and forth with anybody. Uh, to talk about the incident and the response, I have with me writer, editor of Ordinary Times, host of the Her Tale show. Always a pleasure having our dear brother on the program. It's going to be interesting to see exactly what comes out of this because I have some recommendations as to what should have happened. Good day, welcome. How you doing, sir? Always great to be with you. Good to have you, Andrew. Andrew Donaldson. I don't know if I said the name up front. <laughs> so, Andrew, let me ask you this, man, because given your, let's just say, your conservative leaning. And the identifying of that conservative leaning with evangelical faith, Christian evangelical faith in particular. The response that Olstein gave, how did that strike you personally? How do you think it strikes the community at large? I want to be careful because his statement is what I would expect from him, the book we have on him from 20 some odd years of public ministry. That's not what I expected him to say. Now, I got a lot of feelings about him, both theologically sure. and morally. I don't believe what he preaches. I find him to be a charlatan in a lot of ways. Having said all that, his church doesn't deserve to be shot up. He, he's right. just caught in the middle of this. So I think those criticisms and a lot of the ugly stuff on the internet, this ain't the time to joke and mock Joel Olstein. This, this yeah. is not the time for that. This is one of those things that you, I, I like the way you teed it up. Look, if you are serious about your faith, you struggle with things. You don't struggle with your faith, you struggle on working out your faith. And this is one of those things where you're going to struggle and work it out. I, I put out a tweet earlier today, look, the place where I worship has a security plan. Me and my family will not go to a church that doesn't have a security plan. It's sad that that's where we live mm -hmm. at, but that's where we're at now in America. You just have to have that. And one thing, I got my own issues. I don't want to be looking over my shoulder during church. It's hard enough to pay attention as it is, let's be real. Joel Olstein and, and the Lakewood Church, just let's set the scene for people. This is the old summit. This is where the Houston Rockets played basketball back when they were really, really good, right? The, you're talking tens of thousands of people in a downtown location. This could have been really, really bad. There was two off-duty officers there. There was still three people shot. The perpetrator was killed. Their five-year-old son that the shooter brought with them. This is a new twist that's pretty ugly in Wigan. That child's in critical condition. There's also a man who's, by all accounts, an innocent bystander caught around. This could have been a whole lot worse. And here we go again, when we start looking into this individual and the totality of the circumstances, things don't happen in a vacuum, they happen in a sequence. And once again, we have systemic failure of somebody with a 20 year criminal record that somehow showed up with a weapon and it should have been worse, could have been worse, thank God it wasn't. Yep, and I echo your sentiment about, uh, you, you gotta dismiss it at this present moment, you dismiss the theological disagreement yeah. you may have with Joel Osteen and you understand that the service that was um, attempted to be interrupted based on one of the narratives was actually a service for um, um, Latin brothers and sisters who had a service in their native tongue that yes. was about to start. And they want to see if somehow this was a targeted attack because of that, we don't know. But cause and effect matters, cause and mm -hmm. effect matters. Number one, you have this child who's in critical condition, you have a person the, the perpetrator who brought the child in. And the child is now shot. They're saying, oh, we don't know if the cop shot the child or if the perpetrator did. I, I believe the cops probably did. That's just my belief currently. It could change. Uh, and then you have another individual injured. But at the press conference, we're, and we're thankful to God that, no, that nobody else was hurt or killed. At the press conference, when, when you have that kind of, of massive um, 
let, let's let's do this, dear brother. Okay. Let's not let's not look at this as a church. Yeah. Let's look at it as a as a corporation because it is in part a corporation, which Osteen will tell you that. Okay. Yep. So let's look at it as a corporation. This thing happens at one of the biggest corporations in America, all right, at the headquarters. To to not at least say, you know, we're going to pay the the medical bill um, of this five year old, uh, and hope and continue to pray that they pull through. Uh, we're going to pay the medical bill of the uh, fifty some sixty year old person who was shot at another bystander. Uh, and we applaud the work of our security uh, who was able to stop anyone else from being injured or dying. See, to me, that's a whole answer. Do you understand what I'm saying, dear brother? Yeah. Like, I would expect a corporation to say something like that. And if a corporation did not say that, I would be upset that the corporation did not say that. This is one of the largest churches on the planet Earth. Yeah. It's one of the largest on the whole freaking planet. I don't know if there's a church larger than this, it could be. But to not even have that kind of fortitude during this press conference just irks me, man. Because people are suffering, people are hurting. Uh, it's unfortunate that it happened, but you're not powerless, dear brother. You're not powerless, Joel. You can do some things here. What say you? Yeah, there, there was criticism back during the Houston flooding. Remember that a yeah, few years ago? And then they, they came back later and did some things. But in the moment, they kind of missed the bigger picture. You may have a point there. I don't want to overly criticize because, you know, obviously you get waylaid with something like this. You're just trying to not say anything wrong in front of the cameras. I get that. To be fair to the people of the Lakewood Church, there's so many people in that church. If they put out any kind of a message in social media, you would have the money for that probably within a matter of minutes. Yes. If you yes. put it out on yes. any kind of social media platform, people would flood it with more money than those folks get around. And imagine the trauma this five-year-old is going to go through for the rest of their life, even if they recover medically, just what we know now about the parent and what all that's involved. This goes to a word that gets abused in our language a lot, but I want to apply it to these mass shootings because we do this. You got to have a holistic approach to this stuff. And I don't mean the nutty medicine stuff that gets sold to folks. I mean, you got to look at the whole problem here, the community coming together, law enforcement. You just ran how many? Three, four stories in a row on your program, law enforcement not taking care of the problem. We're going to find out now through the legal system, this person, we call it fall through the cracks. Now, I don't think they fell through the cracks. I think the legal system didn't handle them appropriately and may have even made this situation worse. We will find those things out. We need to talk about this societally, law enforcement wise. If you're people of faith in a church like you and me both are, you got to deal with that part of it. More of a holistic approach is because everybody's, well, what was written on the rifle? Well, what did they identify with? Well, which service were they attacking? Everybody wants to take their one little piece out of all these things and go, oh, fix my one little bugaboo piece and it'll solve all of it. No, it won't. You have to attack all of it. We have to have law enforcement that's accountable. We have to have societies that's accountable. Criminals that do small things get reformed, not just made into worse criminals by the system. People with an obvious mental health element, that's got to be added in. Holistic, all of it. These are all of the above answers. We're really bad with all of the above. We like to pick out one or two things, beat our chest, yeah. and then go to the next one because the news cycle's fast enough. We don't have to have accountability for us either, demanding accountability for everybody else. Andrew, look at the numbers, dear brother. Look at the numbers. You have over 90% of individuals in this country, they believe that police reform needs to happen. Yep. You have well over 70% of gun owners who actually agree with red flag laws um, that would alert if an individual has a mental health issue. You have the vast majority of actual gun owners and of non gun owners. They agree on the sentiment of making sure that there's an opportunity to assess after there's a charge of a violent offense. These are common sense to most people. The majority of those who subscribe to the NRA say, yes, this is a good idea. The majority of those who don't subscribe to the NRA but are self-identified gun owners say, yes, we need to do this. We need to work in this direction. Why do you believe that? I know why I believe it's not happening, but why do you believe these common sense policies that obviously connect back to cause and effect are not happening, even though the vast majority of Americans agree they should. Two things, self-serving of people's agenda, and the other thing is there's a little bit of fear involved. Um, the self-serving part is evident. Law enforcement, you talk about churches being a big business, and, and even though I take my faith very seriously, I've studied theology both academically and just because I like it for over 20 years now. 
uh, Christianity in America is a big business. Can we have a grown folk talk about that? Law enforcement is a big business. It's a massive multi-billion dollar business. And that beast needs fed. You gotta have funding, you gotta have grants. And sometimes the policies they pursue are more online with that. Let's just be adults here, that they need that funding. It's a business as well. So it becomes a self-serving thing for law enforcement. People get fear. Yes, you have a right to own a weapon in America. The nitty gritty of that, people get really scared about talking about it. And then you have the other part of it that's fear of this. If we're going to have policy discussions about things like mass shootings, everybody's gonna have something they're wrong about to get to the consensus to fix it. So we can all agree on the buzzword of, oh, we don't wanna have violence or, oh, we don't, we wanna have peace in the street. I like the, I wish police would get back to the old term. The old timers had peace officers. You're supposed to be keeping the peace. Yep. We all wanna have those buzzwords that make us feel good, but we don't understand that to get there, somewhere in there, we're gonna have to give up a little bit. The police is gonna have to give up a little bit. Uh, I would encourage our folks on the right who talk about small government, well, look at the police as what they are. That's the armed enforcement wing of the government that probably could be smaller and more managed. With it. You know, That would fit into their credo of what they believe if they just apply it properly. And folks that are rightfully upset about civil rights in the way police, you just talked about it. Something as simple as in custody is in care. Doesn't matter if it's when the cuffs go on through the bail process, which is creating more criminals than solving. We can talk about that some other time we have in the past. Through incarceration, through prisoner penitentiary, in custody is in care. If we just affix that to stuff, look how much would fix and you wouldn't have those horrible stories you just had. Those go across party spectrums, ideological spectrums. That's just basic human stuff. But we're all gonna have to give up a little bit of what we fear and we're gonna have to give up a little bit of what we're really scared to deal with to get there. And that gap, though really small in theory, is massive when you start putting in the people element of people having to actually talk about it. Yeah. That's hard. Yeah, cops are sworn in as peace officers, uh, to your yep. point about the being peace officers. They're not sworn in as police officers, but peace officers. And here's the other dynamic. The, the policy agenda cannot be disconnected from the special interest agenda. Yeah. And the reason we do not have a policy agenda or a law or legislation with bipartisan support as it relates to some of these dynamics is because you have special interest groups gun manufacturers among them, the most powerful among them. Uh, they advocate and lobby against common sense reform. And it's not just federal. Let me give you a state example. In the state of Georgia, there's a state law that makes it illegal for a local jurisdiction, a county or a municipality to pass any law that would regulate gun safety, for example. If a county wants to regulate how a gun is stored around young minors, that's illegal. They cannot do so. Uh, Commissioner Ted Terry out of a place called DeKalb County, Georgia attempted to do that because there, there were three children who got access to a gun, children, we're talking about well under 10 years old, uh, and tragedy happened, right? So he wants to do something. He wants to make sure that there's an accountability factor, but there's this state law that prohibits him from moving forward. Once again, that's a cause and effect connected to that same lobby. And until you get that lobby out of the way, you're gonna have these massive disconnects where gun owners are saying, yeah, this is a good idea. NRA members are saying this is a good idea, but the manufacturers are saying no, and the top leadership of NRA, NRA they're saying no. So how do, you, uh, how do you dismiss those powerful allies inside of the gun uh, culture, I, th that's the problem. Yeah, and you gotta understand too, the NRA is a very small group of actual gun owners. So even yeah. though they have an outsized influence, although it's waned a lot because people like Wayne Pierre have been corrupt and just ran it into the, just organizationally, I'm talking not ideal. They've just yeah. ran it into the ground, they've bled it dry. It's not what it needed to be at all. There's organizations like that. This is one of those things where you have to be, and this is hard work, this is really hard. It's easy for me to say it, but this is hard. You have to find people of good faith and who are not, who will have these discussions with, look, I'm at my dad's house right now. I'm in the house I grew up in. I'm sitting 25 feet from his gun safe, full of weapons. Most of the weapons I learned to shoot on as a child are all in there. 
they're in the gun safe right now. They're not laying around, although they could be. I know how to handle a weapon, both in uniform and my private life. I know what to do with it. But you have to have good responsibility to that. Who are responsible gun owners? Talk to them. Who are good faith partners who say, yes, I understand I have an enumerated right. And it is, people may not like it, it's an enumerated right. You're not getting around it, it's not going away. Let's talk about it with some good faith of how that right looks in a practical way. Lawmakers don't do a real good job on stuff because they've got those special interests you talk about. This is one of those things that's going to have to be people driven. But again, let's go back to that holistic thing I was talking about. People that don't trust the police are going to want armed and they're going to have a right to their own self security when they don't trust the police. That feeds into this stuff. You have to fix all this, not just one piece of gun legislation, not just the local yep. legislation. This is like a national attitude problem. And we have this on a lot of things. But when you start talking about the individual in Houston that's obviously fell through the cracks 20 years of criminal, including weapons charges, by the way, this was not the first time in the Devon. Now you're talking about deadly consequences to us having a really hard time dealing with some very basic civic stuff. Yeah, well said there, brother. We're gonna have you back on the show to chop it up again. We appreciate all that you do, my friend. Anytime, sir, always enjoy chatting. Same.